brother. Okay, what if Draco actually went through with killing Dumbledore on the lightning struck tower? As it stands right now, Draco can't quite muster the necessary nerve that is required to take down Dumbledore, even though he has reinforcements actively flooding the scene. And so he continues to stall until Snape finally steps in and saves him from committing this true act of evil. This is a very vital piece of the plan that Dumbledore has laid out, and it's really what saves him from ripping his soul apart. But while Draco's soul does manage to remain intact, and it does ultimately work out for them in the long run, the immediate aftermath of this particular evening is not so great for Draco and the rest of the Malfoy family. Voldemort's plan for Draco to kill Dumbledore in the first place is really just overall a punishment for the failure of Lucius at the Department of Mysteries. Voldemort basically intends for Draco to fail and then plans to kill him as a punishment. But Draco ultimately ends up finishing the mission kind of somewhere in the middle. He did, after all, successfully smuggle Death Eaters into Hogwarts, something that was believed to be impossible, and Dumbledore is dead at the end of the day. But Draco himself wasn't the one to do it, and as a result, he's not exactly honored in the way you might imagine. But the question for today is, what if he did do it? What if he did have the necessary nerve and followed through with the plan and successfully kill Dumbledore? Would Snape still be number two? Would Malfoy's family honor be restored amongst the ranks of the Death Eaters? And possibly even more importantly, how would Draco's ripped soul manage things as he moves forward? It is absolutely fascinating because at the end of the day, Dumbledore dies either way, but it is amazing to see the number of differences that come when you ask the question, what if Malfoy killed Dumbledore? Don't you understand? I have to do this. I have to kill you. Okay, so what if Draco had actually killed Dumbledore? I personally find this to be an amazing place to pose this particular hypothetical because Draco himself is a bit at a fork in the road as he enters the scene. For me, Draco's arc up until this point doesn't have a particularly clear trajectory. You don't exactly know which direction he'll go. And for most of the story so far, going back to Harry and his first year, all he's ever really done is just parrot the beliefs of his family. He's never really had to put his magic where his mouth is, so to speak. But the Half-Blood Prince, completely different situation for Draco. He is in a very real, very dangerous, and very difficult situation. There is absolutely no doubt that he is supposed to have been given a task that puts him out of his depth by a mile. It's the mission to kill Dumbledore, something that is otherwise basically considered to be impossible to accomplish. And on top of that, he needs to pull this off under the noses of all of his professors, including Snape, who one, is an accomplished legilimens, so impressive, and also is someone who is actively trying to help him. But Draco is in no mood to share the glory. He wants to do it on his own. Then why not confide in me? And I can. I know what you're up to. You want to steal my glory. There was another pause, then Snape said coldly, You are speaking like a child. I quite understand that your father's capture and imprisonment has upset you, but... I know there are other ways to do the Snape voice, but the Potter Puppet Pals version really just is the best as far as I'm concerned. But either way, it doesn't actually even seem like Draco is going to need to share that particular glory because he does successfully get the Death Eaters inside of the castle, and he does find himself one-on-one -on -one with a weakened and wandless Dumbledore. And this really is the moment, isn't it? This is the fork in the road where Draco is finally going to have to step up for himself and not rely on his family's power and wealth and influence. You wait till my father hears about this. But now it's just Draco standing alone, wand out. And we all obviously know what typically happens here. He stalls long enough for Snape to arrive and fulfill not Voldemort's, but Dumbledore's request. Dumbledore, who of course didn't have long to live anyway, and was very aware of the damage it would inflict upon Draco's soul if he went through with the task. And by orchestrating his own death, Dumbledore believed that the power of the Elder Wand would die with him. And to be honest with you guys, this is always a situation that I wish the reverberations from had been fleshed out even more in the original books. It really could have been the beginning of Draco's true redemption. It's really the moment that would have forced his hand and required for him to choose where his allegiances truly lie. Instead, he just sort of peters out and lands on 
not being actively bad more than being good. His true grand redemption, if you will, is really just being a little like wishy-washy about whether or not it's Harry, Ron, and Hermione when they're captured and brought to Malfoy Manor. So, woo. But again, what happens if all of this goes differently? Instead of failing at the finish line, he goes through with the deed. Well, for one, I do think that his soul would just be fractured and that his allegiances would be solidified under Voldemort's reign. Or at the very least, his allegiance to the dark arts, the regime that Voldemort has set forth. But it's very important to point out that Draco has spent his entire life thinking that he was special and that he was important. And this would really be the first sign that that was coming true. While he may have been absolutely terrified the entire time, he would now be incredibly aware of the fact that he was capable of great things, or how did Ollivander say it? Terrible, but great. So let's start by walking through it. What actual changes would this make to the overall story? First of all, we need to determine when Draco actually would have cast the spell. Is it right when Harry and Dumbledore arrive? Is it when the Death Eaters get there? Or does it wait until Snape arrives? For the purposes of this what if scenario, I am going to go ahead and make the declaration that it happens when the first round of Death Eaters arrive at the tower. Draco has always been scared of what he's going to have to face once he's up there. And let's be honest, for good reason. But I think having at least some cronies by his side is all it really takes to bolster his confidence just enough to cast the spell of Vada Kedavra. And this would end up working out well for him in a way because now he has an entire group of witnesses who can attest to what actually happened. But there's also a very immediate variable that needs to be considered, which is the fact that as soon as Dumbledore has been killed, the freezing charm on Harry is gone and now Harry's at the top of the tower with Draco who just killed Dumbledore. And despite the obvious thinking here that the first thing Harry would do is immediately go on the attack, I don't actually think he would. I think he would be frozen and stunned by what he just witnessed. Which honestly, that's, that's pretty much what happens in the main story anyway. Harry felt as though he too were hurtling through space. It had not happened. It could not have happened. It's not actually until after the Death Eaters have left that he realizes he can even move, which I think is probably for the best because I don't think single-handedly he could have taken all of them. Either way, the Death Eaters flee, and I think very importantly, Snape never actually makes it to the top of the tower and just runs into them during their escape. Harry at this point would be in fast pursuit of Malfoy, and I would say pretty much ready to kill him, given the fact that this is pretty much the reaction he has to Snape after he did it. And it's also not exactly like Harry needs new reasons to hate Malfoy. He's pretty much suspected him correctly the entire year. And so from there, I think that the escape pretty much goes exactly how it normally does, except most of Harry's frustration is directed at Malfoy instead of Snape. Meanwhile, Snape probably does maintain his undercover status and just helps the others get out. One small thing here would be that he would probably not reveal himself as the Half-Blood Prince to Harry, but by escaping with all of the others would prove to Harry that he has in fact been evil the whole time. The really big changes are going to start taking effect as we move closer to Deathly Hallows, specifically the summer that exists between the two stories. Now, normally, despite the fact that Draco has played a pretty massive role in orchestrating the the death of Dumbledore. His family still seems to just remain dishonored because it wasn't Draco himself who did it and it was Snape who normally did it, which elevates Snape's position to number two. <laughs> number two, classic. But this time, of course, Draco did in fact do it, which means that the Malfoy name has fully been restored and Draco has taken that number two spot. Now, normally Voldemort is still using Draco in some capacity in the main story by way of having him torture other people, which is also typically a form of torture for Draco, who was not at all comfortable with doing it. Draco, give Raoul another taste of our displeasure. Do it or feel my wrath yourself. The huge difference here though, is that having just killed Dumbledore himself, Draco's soul is now fractured, and as a result, I think he would actually relish these new responsibilities. Because remember, again, Draco has spent his entire life thinking that he was special and different and extraordinary, and instead has had to watch Harry come in every single year and save the school from some new threat, and win at the Triwizard Tournament, and totally sweep the floor with him at Quidditch. Get it? Sweep? Brooms? Hilarious! But now, he, Draco, has killed the most powerful wizard in the entire world. It is proof to himself 
that he is everything as special as he always thought or was told he was. And now there are no rules. Who is there for him to prove his abilities to? No one. I dare say at this point in time, Draco would even see himself as more important than his own father. Certainly Voldemort would see him that way. And I think that would just bolster his confidence that much more. All I'm really trying to say is that at this point, Draco is happily evil. If anything, just possibly even more power hungry now that he's proven he can do pretty great things. Which of course now brings us to the Deathly Hallows where now Voldemort has a major advantage when it comes to the Battle of the Seven Potters, which is of course Draco. Normally Draco is sidelined for basically no reason at all. No matter what your feelings on him, Draco is in fact an absolutely excellent flyer and would have been a huge help in this battle. And this time I think he will be. The battle is set up just as usual and I don't see there to be any reason why Snape wouldn't confund Mundungus to suggest the seven potters. But what happens if amongst the chaos, there is also a very evil Draco who is very capable of flying up there with them? Well, I think it all comes down to, and say it with me, Hedwig. Now stay with me. Now we all know that Hedwig typically dies in this particular battle. And I have personally long believed that it's Snape being the one that kills her, swiftly realizing that she would be a dead giveaway to the real Potter. Wow, I just heard it, dead giveaway. Wow, yeah, I'm, I am sorry about that one for what it's worth. Point is though, that it means that Snape always knows exactly which Harry is the real one. And for Snape, this time he also has to worry about the fact that Draco's up there too. Would Draco also be able to tell? And honestly, I doubt it, it's complete chaos up there. But what I am sure Draco would be able to spot is Hagrid. And lest we forget, Draco and Hagrid have had some long standing beef. He tried to get him fired in his first year for owning a dragon egg. His father got him sent to Azkaban in his second year. Draco tried to get him fired again in the third year after the hippogriff attacked. And he is the one to complain very loudly to Rita Skeeter about the blast in its in year four. So you get the picture. Now he basically has a free shot and total license to just go after Hagrid himself for all the wrong reasons he ends up chasing the real Harry. Snape then of course realizes that this is happening and must monitor the situation. So also goes in pursuit of Hagrid, Harry, and Draco. Hagrid and Harry's defenses are as effective as usual in warding off the lesser Death Eaters, but Draco is a skilled enough flyer that he is able to avoid all of those. Inevitably, Stan Shunpike, who Harry is obsessed with, Hood will go backwards, causing him to cast Expelliarmus and reveal that he is in fact the real Harry, which causes the other Death Eaters to then call Voldemort to the situation. But Draco himself, having realized that he is now in pursuit of the real Harry, stays on course. Harry, of course, recognizes Draco as well and filled with rage at the person who killed Dumbledore now casts Sectumsempra against Draco, just like he did in their last duel, except but this time probably with even more ill intent. For example, this time he knows what it's gonna do. The spell connects and slashes Draco right across the face, which absolutely enrages Draco, who now stays in even more fierce pursuit. Snape sees all of this unfolding and as usual, casts Sectumsempra in an effort to protect Harry, but as usual, misses. This is the spell that usually hits George, but instead this time finds a different target. Harry feels a searing pain across the side of his head and his ear is gone. He screams in agony, blood is gushing from the side of his face, and he is just literally hanging on with all of his might to stay conscious. Meanwhile, Draco's wound has also caught up with him and has completely stopped his ability to stay in pursuit, but no matter because Voldemort has arrived on the scene. Excellent work, Draco. He hisses as he closes in on Harry. Harry can barely make him out at this point in time, but Voldemort raises the borrowed wand and as usual, Harry's own wand turns of its own accord and casts the golden flames back at Voldemort, destroying the borrowed wand, just as Harry enters the bubble of safety. Harry and Hagrid come to and they're able to take the port key to the burrow. As ever, there is nothing they can do for the cursed wound and Harry's glasses will be forever crooked. I mean, they could probably magic some way for them to like stay on straight, but I do feel like it is customary to immediately make a joke of the missing ear situation. That's pathetic. Speaking of making jokes though, you might be aware of the new silver lining of this particular situation, which is the fact that George makes it through the entire battle with a head full of ears, which is true. But we also have to consider the fact that if Snape wasn't protecting that particular pair of flyers, then this is what would have happened. A Death Eater moved ahead of Snape and raised his wand, pointing it directly at Lupin's back. 
Sectum Sempra, shouted Snape, but the spell intended for the Death Eater's wand hand missed and hit George instead. That sounds to me like whatever Snape did in order to save Lupin is also what cost George his ear. But if he wasn't there, then I don't think Lupin survives this battle. I know, I know, I don't feel good about it either, but I'm not the one making this stuff up. I'm just imagining a pretend scenario about a fictional world and writing it down and presenting it to you. So yeah, no, it is my fault. Shoot. Well, whatever, you can't unwrite Word documents. And as unfortunate as that situation is, it also probably means that Tonks will be sent into yet another depression. I mean, how could it not? They just got married that month. Small silver lining is the fact that we know that Teddy Lupin is normally born on April 11th, 1998. So back up nine months would be July 11th, which means that she's still pregnant. I do like to imagine though, that under this particular set of circumstances that she names the baby either Remus or even better Romulus after his dad rather than her father, because you know, the death thing. Again, I'm sorry. Guys, we need to take a quick break to tell you about today's sponsor, HelloFresh. We all love delicious tasting food, right? But sometimes I honestly feel like it is easier said than done because we all live incredibly busy lives. And at the end of the day, it's not always easy to go and be creative in the kitchen. And honestly, I think that we all deserve for mealtime to be just a little bit easier. And that is where HelloFresh comes in. They deliver wholesome, delicious ingredients right to your door. And that means there are no trips to the grocery store, no lines or hassles, just great tasting food that you're able to whip up from your own home. It's obviously delicious and convenient, but one of the other really huge benefits of HelloFresh is that it is affordable. I don't know about you guys, but in our household, we do have a budget for how much we plan to spend on groceries every single week. And here lately, it doesn't seem like we're covering all of our bases with those allocated funds. HelloFresh is actually cheaper than standard grocery shopping and comes in at 25% less than takeout, which is why now more than ever is the perfect time to get started. Plus, they also make it easy to eat what you love by allowing you to customize meals, swap proteins and sides, and even adding protein to a veggie dish. It's super flexible and customizable. Seriously, guys, I feel like my life lately has just gotten so busy with Addy and two dogs running around and my wife, Alice, and I both operating multiple businesses. I genuinely can't tell you how helpful it is getting home at the end of the day and having all of my ingredients pre-portioned. So all I have to do is put everything together. It doesn't take more than 30 minutes and I've got a great meal for the rest of my family. And that last point is a big deal because not only do Alice and I get tired of cooking the same meals week in, week out, but my daughter Addison, who is not even 18 months old yet, absolutely loves them and she is a certified picky eater, let me tell you. So head on over to hellofresh.com slash supercarlin60 and use promo code supercarlin60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Guys, 60% off is really just a fantastic deal and I definitely think it is worth giving a try. Again, it's going to be hellofresh.com slash supercarlin60, promo code supercarlin60 for 60% 60 off your order plus free shipping. HelloFresh is America's number one favorite meal kit for a reason. Link to all this is in the description down below. Either way though, let's get back to Draco because he's what's important about today's topic. He obviously survives this particular battle, but now has a great big scar right across his forehead, just like he always wanted. Anyway, from there, the story progresses like usual for at least a little while. Harry ends up at the burrow, they inherit Dumbledore's things, Bill and Fleur get married, the ministry falls, they go camping, they steal the locket, they go camping some more, Ron leaves, they go camping even more, Nagini breaks Harry's wand, they go camping yet even more, Ron returns, they destroy the locket, and eventually they get captured by the Snatchers. I wanna say we just breeze through Tonk's whole pregnancy, but we pretty much did. But things over at Voldemort's camp, ha, camping, everybody's camping, are going ever so slightly differently. Again, now Draco is the big number two and essentially in charge of Malfoy Manor when Voldemort is away, which is often. His absences are something that Draco is growing very interested in because he's given very little information about where he's going. In the meantime though, Draco is learning more and more that he really likes being the one who's in charge. And if anything, doesn't like Voldemort's returns because it means he has to go back to being in that number two position. After all, wasn't it he who killed Dumbledore? He, Draco, who followed the correct Potter? Isn't it him that everyone is taking orders from? all day, every day. As such though, I think that Draco starts putting that Slytherin cunning to work and starts investigating Voldemort himself. Where is he always going? Why did he need a second wand? And why did he kidnap 
Ollivander. Voldemort is clearly trying to learn something about wands, but what is it? Now, in the main story, Draco would usually have this exact same exposure to this same information, except typically in the main story, he's trying to keep as low of a profile as possible. Whereas this go round, things are very different. Draco sees himself as chief Death Eater, possibly even a better leader than Voldemort himself, but how to overcome him? Well, that is where Harry and Draco's paths intersect once more. Harry, Ron, and Hermione are, as usual, captured by Fenrir. Harry, complete with stinging jinx on his face. However, now his missing ear is a pretty big giveaway. Although, in case you're wondering how we feel that Harry, Ron, and Hermione would be handling the whole missing ear situation, we like to think that they go back to that Goblet of Fire haircut, you know, and they just cover it. Harry Potter. Good. This is obviously a huge change from the usual story and Harry has to do this all the time. I know because I had the exact same haircut in high school. Actually also kind of hurt my neck. This is the real reason 30 year olds don't have the shag look. Anyway though, Fenrir is still a little bit nervous about having captured Harry and still brings him to Malfoy Manor where now Draco is the one in charge. This time around Draco is not even remotely fooled by the stinging jinx because he's also just missing the ear and sees it as a huge opportunity to interview Harry Potter, AKA the chosen one. And wandless and outnumbered, there's not really a lot that Harry can do here. Draco leads him away into a private room to question him before calling the Dark Lord. Meanwhile, Bellatrix discovers the sword and starts freaking out as per always and starts torturing Hermione. Draco immediately is using her screams to his advantage and says that he can make Bellatrix stop if Harry would just be willing to explain something to him. Harry obviously doesn't want to, but he is very much backed into a corner here and has essentially no bargaining power at least at first. I know that your mind is connected to the Dark Lord's Potter. I know that he used that connection to lure you to the ministry. So perhaps you can tell me where he's going and what he's up to. Your master is not filling you in on everything then, huh? I know plenty, Potter. I know that your wands connected that night in the graveyard, that they're connected by a twin core. The silence is broken as Hermione's screams are heard from across the home. You can make that stop, Potter. Just tell me what you know. Mind racing, Harry starts to realize what Draco is up to. Why would Voldemort be keeping information from him? And more importantly, why would Draco want that information? You want him dead, don't you? You want to be in charge. Draco doesn't respond and Hermione screams again from across the house. Acting on instinct, Harry knows he's backed into a corner and surrounded by enemies. Well, you'll need me if you want him dead. The papers are right. I am the chosen one. That's what the prophecy said. I'm the only one who can do it. Draco contemplates everything that Harry is saying and trying to determine whether or not he's bluffing. If he's telling the truth, he'll need him to carry out his plan. And then he notices the mokeskin pouch around Harry's neck. What's in here, he demands. Empty it. With no choice at hand, Harry empties the pouch and the contents litter the floor. His broken wand, the broken mirror, the snitch, and the marauder's map. Draco picks up the broken wand and asks, is this yours? Harry doesn't respond. Draco then turns and says, I'm positive the Dark Lord is trying to find a way around your twin cores. You destroyed Selwyn's back in July. Why? But just then, Harry is doubled over as he's seeing inside Voldemort's mind. He has found Grindelwald. He's learning about the Elder Wand, where it went and who had it last. What do you see, Potter? Draco demands. But then Draco goes quiet. There's nothing Harry can do to stop him. He's barely maintaining consciousness. As Draco whispers, Legilimens. Now, Draco is not just seeing inside of Harry's mind, but Voldemort's as well. He's seeing everything that Harry's seeing, the Elder Wand and where it is. The Elder Wand, breathes Draco. I thought it was just a children's story, but if he's hunting it and Dumbledore had it, then thanks Potter. And with the crack, he's gone. Just like that, Harry finds himself alone and unarmed inside of Malfoy Manor when all of a sudden he hears another crack. At first he thinks it must be Draco immediately returning from wherever he went off to, but instead it's Dobby. Are you saying you can operate in and out of this room? Of course, sir. I'm an elf. Basically what happened here is that when the Mokeskin purse was opened, the mirror became activated, Aberforth realized where they were and sent Dobby to help. Harry quickly gives Dobby directions as he's also collecting the contents of the pouch when he realizes the broken bits of wand are missing. Dobby quickly returns to find Harry and together they fight their way out of Malfoy Manor where once again, Harry does in fact steal another wand and unfortunately Dobby 
doesn't survive. One minor change here is that I don't actually think Peter Pettigrew ends up dying on this particular occasion because he doesn't have the opportunity to spare Harry's life, which normally causes his hand to turn against him. So he survives, but I don't actually really feel like that makes a huge difference. Meanwhile, as Harry is arriving at Shell Cottage, he has yet another vision into Voldemort's memory where he finds he is incredibly happy. He is at Dumbledore's tomb and he has discovered the Elder from here, again, things progress as you might expect. We've got Shell Cottage, Gringotts, Grip Hook, Sword, Dragon Cup, Swimming, and Voldemort finally figuring out Harry is hunting Horcruxes and revealing the final location to Harry, which is, of course, Hogwarts. Harry then arrives at Hogwarts himself, rallies the DA to prepare for battle. The big difference that we're going to be dealing with now is the fact that Snape didn't actually kill Dumbledore, so his own death isn't quite as imminent as usual. But also the fact that Snape normally delivers the prince's tale to Harry through memory is because he's dying and there's no other way to do it. A situation where Snape and Harry both were pretty lucky that Harry ended up being there during his death. But this time around, Snape might just know where Harry is in the process and can actually tell him what's happening. Granted, as always, he's still going to be perceived as a villain and thrown from the castle and will still probably have to battle his way back through in order to get to Harry to tell him the vital information that Harry must die. Yes, he must die. And this is where you might want to pause and be like, well, wait, I mean, yeah, Snape isn't suspected by Voldemort as being master of the Elder Wand, but wouldn't Draco be? Wouldn't Voldemort be trying to track him down to kill him to gain mastery? And I do think that Voldemort would think that, and I do think that he would be trying to track him down. But as ever, Draco is cunning. Draco, this wand has not performed the magic that is promised of it. Do you know why? It is because I have not won it from its former master. My lord, you stole it from his grave. Surely that counts. No, Draco, this wand recognized the new master before Dumbledore died. You defeated him. It is regrettable. You have served me well. Allow me one last act of service then, my lord. I know you've been hunting for a way around the twin course between you and Potter's wands. While we had him at Malfoy Manor, he revealed to me that his wand was destroyed. The protection is broken. And of course, Draco stole the bits of wand, so he draws them out and shows Voldemort as proof of his claim. And seeing the bits of broken wand right before his eyes, he lights up with a look of triumph calls off his forces and demands Harry be delivered to the Forbidden Forest. Turning to Draco, he then whispers, You have served me three times, Draco. You killed Dumbledore, found the true Potter, and discovered his broken wand. For this, Draco, I shall spare your life. He reaches up and touches Draco's forehead, where the scar has now healed and resembles a slithering snake. I suppose that makes you the boy who lives. Meanwhile, Harry, Ron, and Hermione find and destroy the diadem in the Room of Requirement, although this time they'll just use Basilisk's fangs because they have them, so no fire, but you know, almost as fun. Who am I kidding? It's not nearly as fun. Love the fire. Boom! And then as ever, Harry knows that the time has come. He must face down Voldemort. He must die. So he makes his way to the forest and as usual, tells Neville to finish off the snake if he is able to. Harry arrives in the forest and like always, <laughs> afterwards though, things do go just a little bit differently. Instead of sending over Narcissa to check to see if he is still alive, Voldemort sends over Draco. Draco checks, finds that Harry is still alive and slips something inside of his pocket and then announces Potter is dead. Cheers erupt from all around and Voldemort leads the conquering army back to the gates of Hogwarts. He shows off the body and taunts all of Harry's followers. Neville steps forward, the sorting hat is summoned, pulls the sword out, Slice Nagini is dead. Harry wakes up and the battle resumes. Voldemort's forces are falling left and right. But Voldemort himself is also in the fold and striking people down. Harry finally reveals that he is in fact still alive and starts to try to talk Tom Riddle down. It's over, Tom. There are no Horcruxes left. Your army is defeated. You tried to kill me in the forest again tonight and failed. Surrender. Voldemort points the Elder Wand directly at Harry, who is arms out and wandless. This is how you face me, Potter. No weapon. There is no protection left for you, Potter. Draco showed me your broken wand. There are no twin cores left. No one will die for you now. Then what are you waiting for? Are you afraid you'll fail again? Afraid you'll fail to kill me a third time? Voldemort hesitates. Fear flashes across his face, but then Avada Kedavra! A jet of green light is shooting towards Harry, but then his own pocket twitches. The item that Draco had left for Harry flies into his hand. It's Harry's original holly wand, fully 
intact. It erupts into golden flames once again, and this time there is no stopping it. It blasts right through Voldemort's spell and into the man himself. Voldemort falls lifeless to the ground, consumed by the flames. And the onlooking crowd is silent. Harry himself is staring at his own wand in his hand in quiet disbelief. The silence though is broken when someone shouts, Protego! Suddenly a large bubble erupts around Harry and the drawling voice of Draco Malfoy begins to speak. Well done, Potter, he steps forward. Well done indeed, just as you said. It had to be you. Draco, says Harry, lost in disbelief. But how? You told me everything I needed to know, gave me everything I needed. I saw how your wand reacted to Voldemort's that night in July. I knew if I could arrange it again, you'd finish him off. I read your mind in Malfoy Manor. You told me he was seeking the Elder Wand, and he believed he found it. But I got there first. I beat Voldemort to the tomb. He thought he found the Elder Wand, but he's been carrying around my old wand this whole time. I suppose I must give him credit. He knew something was wrong with the wand. And in a way, he was right. The wand he held was not extraordinary or ancient. I bought it from Ollivander's when I was 11. I took your broken wand. I knew it meant something to him. He spared my life because he knew your protection was gone. But he didn't know I held the true Elder Wand, that I, who killed Dumbledore, was its true master. At this point, Harry's eyes are just fixed on the Elder Wand that is now pointed directly at him. I used the Elder Wand to repair your wand and returned it to you so that you could defeat him. After all, it had to be you. But now you face me and there is no protection for you now. I killed Dumbledore. I arranged Voldemort's death. I am the master of the Elder Wand, and now I am going to kill you. At this point, Harry has no choice. Everything Draco has explained fits perfectly. There was no time left. All he could do is try. So once again, Harry raised his Holly Wand, and once again, he heard the incantation, Avada Kedavra. As ever, Harry counters with Expelliarmus. The Protego bubble around them explodes like a clap of thunder. Draco's spell was deflected back at him, the Elder Wand sword, and Harry snatched it from the air. He's staring down at the wand in his hand in utter disbelief when all of a sudden, understanding washes over him. Draco had switched his own wand with the Elder Wand, and Voldemort had been using Draco's wand, believing it was the Elder Wand. But that meant when Harry defeated Voldemort, he also defeated Draco's wand, and as a result, became the master of the Elder Wand, who then refused to defeat its owner. Draco's scheme had been brilliant, and it very nearly worked, if not for a single flaw in the plan. And that is what would have happened if Draco had killed Dumbledore. Guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to see more what if action from us, you can check out this video right here that goes through the entire timeline of what would have happened if Harry had been sorted into Slytherin. But otherwise, until next time, bye.